his Easter Sunday. We remembered his suffering on Good Friday, his love poured out for us, and the weight of our sins that he bore upon the cross. But today, we come together not to mourn, but to celebrate. He is risen. He is, he is risen. risen indeed. He is risen. He is, he is risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. I invite you now to join with both the worship team and our Easter choir as we lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving for the victory won, the chains broken, and the hope restored through the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Please stand and let's sing together.
Good morning, church. A blessed res resurrection morning to all. Let me just take your thoughts to the Gospel of John when he wrote, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, so that we can know this singular truth, that there is salvation in no other. The writer to the Hebrews records that Christ offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears. In Matthew, we read, Christ fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What a day to be thankful for and realize that he has done all that is necessary for so great a salvation. Shall we pray? Oh, Lord, when we read your words, the plowers plowed on my back, they made their furrows long. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When you make his soul an offering for sin. For he shall bear their iniquities. He bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. We thank you especially this day that you did not allow your Holy One to see corruption and that Christ was seen by over 500 witnesses and that he is our high priest ever making intercession on our behalf. Hallelujah, Christ arose. With the psalmist we are drawn to say, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, we do remember that cup that cup of redemption, and the words, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of their sins. We confess our sins, O Lord, before you. We, you know our hearts. Forgive our sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Help us in our walk that we not grieve the Holy Spirit, but be renewed in the spirit of our minds to walk in newness of life. Refresh us. Help us to walk in step. May it be your word that leads us onward. We thank and praise you for what you have done. What manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. We would pray that if there's anyone here that has not heard this precious, precious gospel, that you would touch their hearts this day and they would, that they would come to believe this great salvation. O oh Lord, we pray for the world in which we live. The hearts of men are desperately wicked. And we sense as those who believe the fulfillment of your word. We lift up those that are sick, the struggling, the burdened. Help us with the eyes of faith, not to look at the wind and the waves, but that we keep our eyes fixed on you. May we look to you for help and strength from day to day. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Lord, we would pray that the time that we spend together would be in worship to you. We pray for Pastor Steve that you would anoint him for the words that he speaks today. And as we close, may we rehearse now what we will be saying then. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive the power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Amen. We serve a God who is alive and active in our lives. He is the risen one, and he has overcome death and sin through his power and his blood. We can face tomorrow with confidence because he lives. The Bible tells us in Romans 6, 9 to 10, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Let's continue singing together.
Amen. Let's bow our hearts in a word of prayer together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this Easter Sunday. Father, we thank you for the celebration, for the remembrance that everything is different because Jesus arose, that the empty tomb is the hinge of history, that everything that comes after it is different than what came before, because in the empty tomb we have hope and we have purpose and we have power. Because Jesus is here with us this morning, because Jesus is who he claimed to be, he has the power he claimed to have that he will do what he said he would do. So, Father, as we come this morning, as we open up your word, as we remember again, as we celebrate again in this place, Father, we pray that through your spirit, come and teach us, Holy Spirit. Come and fuse us with hope and with life and with power. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Back in 1922, a British archaeologist by the name of Howard Carter became famous when he discovered the intact tomb of King Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun was a young Egyptian pharaoh who lived and ruled about 1300 BC. Now, there had been other tombs that had been found in Egypt before, but there was none like this one, completely untouched, completely intact. There was so much wealth in the tomb of Tutankhamun that it took seven weeks to get all 5,400 items out. Amongst the treasure was solid gold coffin, golden face masks, chests, chairs, and even seven model boats. Even though Tutankhamun only ruled for 10 years, there's a lot that we know today about him because of the contents of his tomb. It was a famous find at the time. But today we want to celebrate not a tomb that is full, but a tomb that is empty. Often we get to know a lot about a person by their tombstone, right? By the words that are written on that gravestone. Often they try to sum up the life of a person. But today we want to talk about a simple empty tomb. And I want to, you to turn with your, me in your Bibles to John chapter 20, verses 1 to 8. John 20, verses 1 to 8. I know these are familiar words. Speaking of that first Easter Sunday, almost 2,000 years ago. John 20, verse 1 says this. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. And so Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. And then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. And he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth had been folded up by itself, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed." Today is Easter. We celebrate the fact that Jesus has risen, that Jesus is alive, that the tomb is empty. Because the tomb of em is empty, there are three important truths that we all understand and that we all believe this morning. Because of the empty tomb, number one, we understand God's power. The tombs of Egypt are famous for what they contain, the mummified body of Egyptian kings. If you go to London, England today, you can visit Westminster Abbey. It's revered because in Westminster Abbey, there rests 
the bodies of many English nobles. You can go to Arlington Cemetery in Washington, D.C. It's the honored resting place for a lot of uh, many outstanding Americans. But the tomb of Jesus is the tomb we talk about today, and it is the most important, not for what it holds, but for the fact that it holds nothing, for the fact that it's empty. The empty tomb reminds us of God's power. It is the fulfillment of many, many prophecies, many of which were written hundreds of years before the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The prophecies told how the coming Messiah would die, how he would be buried, and how he would be raised from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus is God's definitive proof that God has the power to do what God said he would do. It proves that Jesus is who he claimed to be. The empty tomb of Jesus transforms the life of everyone who experiences the risen Christ. There are those who try to argue that Jesus never rose from the dead, that it was all just a story. There are some people who try to deny the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. They say, yes, there was this man, this nice guy called Jesus, and he lived 2,000 years ago, but he died and he was buried and that's it. They argue that Jesus, this nice prophet, was beaten, was scourged, had a crown of thorns placed down onto his head, piercing his flesh, that he was scourged, his back was ripped open, by the lashes, that he carried a heavy cross, had nails driven through his hands and his feet, died there, had a spear put into his side so that blood and water came out, signifying that the body had already died, that that he was dead. His death was certified by an expert in death, a Roman soldier who had done this many, many, many times before. He was then put into a grave, a tomb, wrapped in a hundred pounds of tightly wound linen that somehow he just suddenly came to and ripped away that linen, rolled away that stone that had taken ten men to put in place, scared away a legion of soldiers, and that's what had really happened. Not likely. Others argue that the disciples stole the body of Jesus, that these fearful disciples who were hiding in an upper room, who were afraid to even be associated with Jesus because of the Roman authorities and what would happen as a result, that that fear suddenly just magically went away and they, you know, sprung up with courage and went and, and, you know, stole the body of Jesus and then all went out and died horrific deaths for something that they knew was not true. Not likely. Others argue that the disciples simply went to the wrong tomb that morning that they got it wrong, that they were supposed to, Jesus was buried in this tomb, and they went there to a a tomb that was was already empty, and, and, and they were just confused. That Joseph of Arimathea had just kind of forgotten where he had buried him. Isn't it amazing that Peter could stand up days later and proclaim to everyone that Jesus had risen from the dead, and the authorities could not produce a dead body? They could not produce a dead body because the body wasn't there. All they had to do was simply produce the body of Jesus and it all would have gone away. All of the rumors, all of the stories, it all would have gone away. But they couldn't because he was not there. He was risen. 1 Corinthians 15.1 says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and which you've taken your stand. By this gospel you were saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise you've believed in vain. For I received and passed on to you of first importance that Christ died for our sins according with the scripture and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Peter and then the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, many of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then all the apostles and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. The Apostle Paul could speak of Jesus appearing to more than 500 people. Think about this. 500 people. 
That means that if every one of those 500 people were to get up this morning and give a six-minute testimony, just a a simple six-minute testimony of the risen Christ, that we would be sitting here 50 hours listening to that. The truth is that Jesus did rise from the dead. Josh McDowell went to school to become a lawyer. He was an agnostic. He started out to write a paper disproving the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in the end, he ended up writing his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, proving that Jesus did, in fact, raise from the dead. Professor Tom Arnold was an English educator and historian. He wrote a three-volume history of the Roman Empire. This great scholar, upon looking at the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus, wrote this, I have been for many years, uh, used many years the study of histories of other times and examining and weighting the evidence of those who have written about them. And I know of no one fact in history of mankind which is proved by better or fuller evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer than the great sign which God had given us that Christ died and rose again from the dead. Dr. Frank Morrison was a lawyer. He was brought up in an atheistic household. He too sat down and tried to write a book disproving the resurrection of Jesus. And again, at looking at the evidence, he ended up writing a book entitled, Who Moved the Stone? A book proving the resurrection of Jesus. The first chapter entitled, A Book That Refused to Be Written. The empty tomb reminds us of God's power. A power that points to God's ultimate purpose. That Jesus came to save us. That Jesus came to set us free. Ephesians 1.18 says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. The empty tomb reminds us of God's power. The same power that that, that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that's available here in this place this morning. No matter what you're going through, no matter what your trial, no matter what your difficulty, the resurrection of power of Jesus Christ is available to us this morning. As 1 Corinthians 6 reminds us, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. As Bruce Larson wrote, the events of Easter cannot be reduced to a creed or philosophy. We are not asked to believe in the doctrine of the resurrection. We are asked to meet the person raised from the dead. In faith, we move from a belief in a doctrine to the knowledge of a person. Ultimate truth is a person. We met him. He is alive. I know that there are many people in this church who listen to Bill and Gloria Gaither. Back in the 1960s, the Gaithers were going through a, a very difficult time in their ministry. Bill had had many quite difficult health issues. Gloria was pregnant, and it had not been an easy pregnancy. On top of everything else, their music had come under criticism, and there were a lot of people writing a lot of very nasty things about them. Well, it was New Year's Eve, and Gloria was sitting there in her house, And she was worried as she was thinking about bringing this new baby into the world. She was worried about the kind of world she was bringing that baby into. She wrote this of that night. I sat alone in the darkness thinking about the rebellious world and all of our problems and about our coming baby. Who in their right mind would bring a child into a world like this? At the height of her fear, at the height of her doubt and her uncertainty, She says that she can't explain what happened next, but suddenly she felt the presence of God come. And she writes, I suddenly felt released from it all. The panic that had built up inside me was replaced by a reassuring presence, and a soft voice kept saying to me, don't forget the empty tomb. Don't forget the empty tomb. 
And she says then she knew that everything was going to be all right. She picked up a pen and a piece of paper and wrote down these words. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy it gives, but greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. That because Jesus lives, this world is different. Because Jesus lives, because the tomb is empty, we know that Jesus, that God has the power that he claimed to have. Maybe you've experienced a death. Maybe you've experienced this year a difficulty, something in your life. I can tell you this morning and I can stand up here and say that no matter what it is, God is more powerful, that God is greater. God's power, number one. But number two, God's priority. Jesus didn't simply come and die for no reason. He died for a purpose. The empty tomb shows us God's priority, that Jesus came to die for us so that we could be raised, so that we could be set free. Jesus came for a reason. It's been said that Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. Luke 19, verse 10 says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. That was his purpose. That's the reason he came. That's the reason he died. Hebrews 12 reminds us, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We were the joy that was set before him. We are the reason that Jesus went to the cross. It was us that he saw. We are God's priority. He did it because he loves us. Matthew 18 says, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 in the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he's happier about the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. That's our value to God, that God loves us, that we have infinite worth and infinite value in his eyes. Do you understand your identity? Do you understand who you are? There's a lot of people, we hear a lot about that today, about identity, about people wrestling in terms of finding their identity. Do you understand the reason you were born? Do you understand the reason that you exist? Take a look, this is a Calvin and Hobbes uh, strip. I'm a little older, so you know I actually grew up reading Calvin and Hobbes. In this strip, you know, Calvin is at school and the teacher's attempting to teach him. And she says, if there are no questions, we'll move on to the next chapter. And Calvin says, I have a question. Certainly, Calvin, what is it? And he says, what's the point of human existence? <laughs> and the teacher says, oh, I, I mean the questions about the subject at ham. And Calvin says, oh, well, quite frankly, I'd like to have this issue resolved before I expend any more energy on this. <laughs> right? And while I laugh at this, I can appreciate Calvin's motive. Because deep down, we all long to answer that question. Deep down, we all want to know why we exist. Why were we born? What is our purpose in life? God created us to love us. God created us because of the overflow of his love. He created us as objects of his love. That we are valuable and that we are precious to him. That is our worth. That is our value. Heard the story that years ago there was a gem dealer that was strolling down the aisle of a Tucson gem and mineral show. And um, people go to this Tucson show and they bring in rocks that they found up in the hills. And, and as they do, they bring them down. And any of the ones that are kind of nice, they bring and they'll lay out at a table. And people can walk by and people can actually buy the stones. And so this gem dealer is walking through and he sees this box. And in this box, there's this one kind of bluish stone. And he picks it up and he turns it in his hand. And he says to the guy, how much you want for this? And the guy said, ah, give me 15 bucks. 
And the guy goes, you want 15 bucks for this? And the guy goes, ah, you're right, just give me 10. And so he handed him $10. The stone was certified as a 1,900 carat star sapphire, 800 carats larger than the largest other stone ever found. It was apprised at millions and millions of dollars. But you see, it took a lover of stones to recognize that that was a star sapphire sitting in that box among all the rest. And it takes a lover of souls that when Jesus looks at us, he sees in us that we are precious. He sees in us that we are special because he created us, because he made us, and that he loves us. When Jesus rose, what were the first words he says other than to the, you know, don't hold me, Mary? When he appears before the disciples, what's the first words he says? On John 19, on the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. His first word, peace. Peace. There was one disciple that wasn't there, Thomas. He missed it. He was out doing something else. And so Jesus comes back a week later and again appears before the disciples. Verse 26, a week later the disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. And the first word, peace. Peace. In the midst of their doubt, in the midst of their fear, in the midst of their brokenness, in the midst of all that they had gone through, this great tragedy, this guy who they thought was going to save them from the Romans, this guy who who they'd pinned their hopes, had died, and, 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 and what did that mean for them, and what did that mean for humanity? And Jesus comes and he speaks peace. And the same thing this morning. He speaks that word to each one of us, peace, peace. No more shame, no more fear, no more grief, No more uncertainty, no more doubt, peace. God's power, God's priority. And lastly, God's presence. The empty tomb reminds us that because Jesus lives, that he's with us. Right now, in this room, he's with us. The Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God is here amongst us and within us. Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus promised he would go with us. He would be with us. No matter where we go, no matter what we do, no matter where we are, Jesus is with us. There is no height that he is not there. There is no depth that he is not there. He is always with us. David Livingston was a missionary to Africa. After 16 years in Africa, he returned to Scotland to address some students at Glasgow University. 16 years had taken a toll on him. His body had been ravaged by fever through several bouts of malaria. His one arm hung at his side, the result of being mauled years before by a lion. The core of his message that day was simply this. Shall I tell you what has sustained me amidst all the toil, the hardship, and the lowliness of my travels? Shall I tell you what has sustained me, sustained me these past 16 years? And then he said, it was Christ's promise. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The fact that God went with him, that Jesus was always with him. And that promise gave him hope, not just hope for David Livingston, but hope for each one of us. No matter where we are, no matter what the circumstances of our lives this morning, that God is here, that Jesus is with us. God is always with us. However, often we don't always feel
that God is with us, right? I heard one pastor say this one time. Why is it that we sometimes don't experience the presence of God in a way that we should? And he said, let me give you an example. If you're driving down the road and you look in your rearview mirror and a police car pulls up behind you, what happens? Well, suddenly you sit upright. (laughs) Your your hands are, you know, at the right position on the steering wheel. You use all the right signals. You're checking your speed. You're making sure you're going exactly the right speed. You're making sure that you come to a full stop at the stop sign. You're making sure you come to a full stop at the light. You're, you're, You're driving very, very carefully. Why? Is it because the presence of a police officer behind you has reminded you of what a good driver you are? Has it reminded you of the fact that that you are such a fine driver that you're going to make sure that you do everything properly? No, you don't want a ticket. That's why you're driving slower. That's why you're being so careful. You don't want a ticket. And likewise, think about this. If every time we looked in our rearview mirror, we saw the eyes of God sitting there staring at us with that constant threat, you do anything wrong and I'm going to get you. you. You take one wrong step, you say one wrong bad thing, you do one wrong and I'm going to, you know, the hammer's coming down and punishment is going to be there. That isn't who God is. God allows us to go through life making our own choices. God allows us to go through life. And there are times when we may not feel, we may not understand, we may not sense the presence of God as we do other times. But that doesn't mean that he's not there. It simply means that he's not forcing compliance. It simply means that he's standing back and allowing us to make the decisions to go through life. The decision is always ours. We can either remember or we can reject the presence of God. In every moment, in every day, every morning we wake up, we can make the decision. Is today a day that I'm going to live in the presence of God? That I'm going to live according to the power of God? under the priority of God? Or is today a day I'm just going to live for self? It's a choice that we have to make. As I said at the beginning, Howard Carter became famous for discovering the intact tomb of King Tutankhamun. He wrote in his memoirs that that fateful day, November the 4th, 1922, as the digger was digging, it hit the top of that first stair. And he had the team come over and they uncovered the, fir- the top of the stairs. And they began digging down each stair, each stair, deeper, 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 until they had uncovered the doorway. And the sun was going down. And Howard Carter called for a light to be brought. And there was this little crack in the doorway, and he shined the light through the doorway and peered inside. And someone asked him, what do you see? And he turned and he said, marvelous things, marvelous things. And then he went back to the top of the stairs, and it says he put his hand in his head, his head in his hands, and he began to weep. And one of the diggers was standing there beside him, and they said, Mr. Carter, why do you weep? Why are you you so sad? This is a wonderful day. This is a glorious day. You've been looking for this tomb for 10 years. And he had. For 10 years, he had sought that tomb. For 10 years, he had invested his entire family fortune. He had spent all of the money he had. But finally, here was the discovery. The digger asked him, why are you sad? He looked up at him and he said, 
10 years of my life. 10 years ago, I dug 18 inches from the top of that step. 18 inches away. 10 years of his life, all of his family fortune gone. When 10 years ago, he could have simply dug there instead of there. He was so close. So very close. Imagine if he had dug 18 inches the other way and had never seen the top of that step. It reminds me this morning that we can come, we can hear about the risen Jesus, that we can remember, we can read these words that Jesus said, these words that have been written about him, and we can still miss it. Like Josh McDowell or Frank Morrison, as they sat down to disprove the resurrection, they were so close, and eventually they found it. But make sure you don't leave this place today being so close and yet still so far. There is a doorway leading to eternal riches that Jesus offers a gift this morning, the gift of salvation to all who would receive, to all who would invite Jesus into their hearts. That invitation is here this morning. Paul talked about the 500 who had seen the risen Christ. Well, we're not quite 500 here this morning. But I bet if I was to ask this morning, has anyone here experienced the risen Christ? That there would be a lot of hands that would go up. There could be a lot of people that could stand and testify that they've met the risen Christ. That there was a time in their life when Jesus came and Jesus met with them and they received him as Lord and Savior in their life. That they walk with him, that they talk with him, that they have that same hope that Gloria Gaither talked about that one New Year's Eve. That the risen Jesus is here this morning. Make sure you don't leave this place without finding him as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful Easter Sunday. We thank you for the tremendous truth that Jesus is risen. And that because Jesus is risen, it proves his power. It proves his priority. And it proves ultimately his presence, which is with us in this place. That, Father, as we think about this day, uh, Father, as we look at our lives, as we think about the challenges that surround us, the challenges of this world, the, the challenges of our nation, the challenges just within our own families in terms of relationships or workplace or, or, or health or whatever that may be. There are so many things. But we know this morning that because he lives, we can face tomorrow. That because he lives, all fear is gone. We know he holds the future and that life is worth living because he lives. Amen. Would you please stand with us and let's sing together. So
Just a couple of announcements. Uh, the first is that um, we had coffee and tea available before the service, but we also have it after the service. And if you didn't grab one of those marshmallow chocolatey things in there, wow, they were amazing this morning. So uh, please feel free to, to grab a coffee and tea after the service. The second is this. Um, I know that a, a number of people here have been watching uh, the film series The Chosen. Uh, series four was uh, set, or uh, year four was supposed to be uh, released, but because they've had licensing problems, it was released in the theater, but it's probably going to be a couple more months before The Chosen season four is released. But we have received actually permission from The Chosen to show it here in the church. So starting next Sunday morning, nine o'clock, we're going to be starting The Chosen season four, episode one uh, here. Uh, in somewhere in the church, we're not exactly sure where, depends on the number of people who come, but we'll be showing that uh, here in the church. So if you didn't see it in theater, if you've been waiting to see it and you don't want to wait for it to be released uh, to personal streaming, come next Sunday, 9 o'clock, and you can watch it. Amen? Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and grant you his peace. God bless you.